Muy buenas tardes, bienvenidos a un evento más de esta cuarta edición del Festival del Libro Medieval, organizado por el Fondo de Cultura Económica, Educal y Ardemac. En esta ocasión tenemos eh, la enorme ventaja y el honor personal de poder presentar a un muy estimado medievalista, y no solo estimado medievalista, tengo el privilegio también de decir un amigo, desde Inglaterra. Lamentablemente no nos alcanzó para traerlo hasta acá y no era muy eco-friendly hacerlo volar <risa> para el fin de semana, pero afortunadamente con la tecnología y un poco de la normalización que nos dejó la pandemia, podemos hacer este, esta conferencia una realidad. Para compartirla con ustedes en el marco de este evento, y puedan también tener interacción co con él. Déjenme presentarlo, porque he hablado de mi amigo el medievalista, pero ni siquiera he dicho cómo se llama. <ríe> él es el doctor Alaric Hall de la Universidad de Leeds. Él es eh, filólogo inglés medievalista. Tiene educación en las universidades de Cambridge y Glasgow. Es eh, elemento docente y líder de la Universidad de Leeds en la Escuela de Inglés y también en el Instituto de Estudios Medievales. Además de ser una voz activa y vigente en los estudios medievales, Alaric tiene una agenda política muy activa, una de las razones por la que también atrae la atención de muchos estudiantes, de muchos colegas, además de su carácter siempre ameno. Le agradezco a Alaric el poder estar con nosotros, aunque sea de manera virtual, el compartir este tiempo con ustedes. Y para no darle ya más vueltas al asunto, le voy a dejar el micrófono, la voz a Alaric, quien nos va a hablar de un tema que él ha trabajado ya de hace tiempo, desde su tesis doctoral, que es los elfos en la vida cotidiana pero ya le toca a él a explicarlo. La conferencia va a ser en inglés, no se tiene pensado una interpretación simultánea, sin embargo, podemos hacerla eh, posterior, después de cada pasaje, dependiendo de qué tan eh, necesario sea, y ahora sí dependemos de ustedes, público, para que por favor no les dé pena y puedan interactuar. Igualmente, estamos eh, presentando esto, ya Eric tiene presentada esta conferencia, para que también podamos interactuar al final. No, no va a ser eh, cátedra de una hora entera, pero para que podamos tener el tiempo de hacer la interpretación, de ser necesaria, y sobre todo para preguntas, respuestas, comentarios, ya podré voltear la computadora para que también Alaric los pueda, los pueda ver. En fin, sin más demora, les presento de nuevo al doctor Alaric Hall. The floor is yours, Alaric. So, sorry, just a second, I think. Uh, sorry, ah, lo siento. Yeah, yeah. Lo siento. <laughs> Buen día. Lo siento que hablar hoy en inglés. Uh, hablo solo un poco de español. Espero que todos puedan entenderme. Uh, si hablo demasiado rápido, dímelo. Okay, that was my Spanish bit. Uh, that's that's all you get. I'm sorry, but um, uh, Erwin, of course, just intervene if I'm talking too fast or if you want me to pause so that you can comment on what I'm saying. And um, I know we've started a little bit later than planned, and uh, there are several different points where this presentation can stop. So if uh, if we get to the point where you're like, okay, this is too much, then uh, it's okay. There, there are different places where, where I can come to a halt. Um, so this first slide was actually supposed to have a picture of the cover of a book that I wrote in 2007 called Elves in Anglo-Saxon England. Um, and uh, something going a bit strange with the PowerPoint presentation. So you'll see the, the cover appear briefly as I go to the next slide. But um, the key thing about this presentation then is that uh, I was working on elves up until about 2007 a lot. And Erwin thought you guys might be interested to hear about uh, elves as a 
present presencia uh, cotidiana in uh, medieval England. So that's what you'll hear about. But I'm sort of trying as I go along to integrate the scholarship that's taken place about elves since 2007 and to point hopefully in some of the directions that research might go in future. Okay, so what is an elf or what are elves? And there are lots of ways that you could sensibly answer this question. Um, for me, partly, possibly for some of you guys in the audience, like elves are Legolas and other Lord of the Rings fantasy literature kinds of guys. So, you know, maybe that gives us some sense of what an elf is. Um, as we'll see during this talk, there's a kind of strong uh, Christian and maybe more kind of widely Abrahamic tradition of thinking about elves as demons under another name. Uh, and yet another way to think about elves is that they are beings which are labelled with the word elf, or maybe other words that come into the Germanic languages from the proto-Germanic word elves. So back when I did my PhD and I wrote my first book, um, I was indeed thinking really about what the word elf meant in the past. And so studying the meaning of the word was the way that I was trying to study past beliefs and culture. And that means that I was thinking about elves very much in terms of Germanic language words. So you'll be hearing today a bit about the Old English word elf, which becomes elf in modern English, um, and it's plural alva. We might hear a bit about Old German Alp, and it's plural Elpi, uh, and we'll certainly hear about the Old Norse, the medieval Scandinavian word Alvar, plural Alvar. So one way to think about this subject then is going to be things that are called elves in Germanic languages, but I'll sort of move away from that towards the end of the talk and problematise that uh, idea. Okay, so... Oh. Yeah. Díganme cómo van entendiendo si hace falta. ¿Todo bien? Excelente. ¿Eh? Ok, excelente. Así al final. Thanks, people. No, fantastic. Yeah, they don't need the interpretation so far. So. Ok, you know, let me know if it starts to go wrong. Put up your hand if yes, I please. use words that are strange and difficult. Con esa confianza, um, si algo se confunde, levanten la mano y, y paramos y interpretamos. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I've said, well, I've talked about what elves are or were, um, but what are elves for and what are they for in our own culture right now? So I'll start with the present and then I'll work my way backwards fairly quickly into the past. Um, and if we think about fantasy literature or, uh, you know, fantasy films or especially computer games, which are very kind of prominent in media today, um, elves usually or perhaps always have something to do with race, um, often something to do with class. So, you know, I've got this picture of Legolas on the screen and an orc, and Legolas is clearly kind of screaming ideals of white blonde-haired, blue-eyed, beauty, uh, kind of linking those ideas with justice and manliness and heroism. And then we have an unfortunate orc next to Legolas. And, you know, certainly when Tolkien was writing the kind of fantasy literature that has so influenced modern media, kind of unconsciously, but nonetheless, Actually, he was definitely thinking about race as he thought about elves and orcs. And he was definitely thinking about class as well. You know, so in The Lord of the Rings, orcs talk like low class English people. Elves talk like well-educated, aristocratic English people. So um, we are definitely using elves in the present to think about race. But I'm going to take that as a sort of stepping stone, J.R.R. Tolkien, who used to teach at Leeds, where I now teach, so I am in some sense J.R.R. Tolkien's successor. Um, I'll take him as a, a starting point for thinking about what elves uh, are doing elsewhere in modern culture. 
And to do that, I'm going to go to Iceland. Um, oh, no, just before I get there, here's a great book by a woman called Helen Young on fantasy and science fiction medievalisms. So Helen Young has done a lot of really good thinking about medievalism, the use of the medieval in the present and its relationship with race, as well as gender and other kind of forces like that. But now, now I'm going to think for a moment about J.R.R. Tolkien and uh, partly to think about Iceland as well. So although we will get to quotidian medieval England, we're going to go through Iceland to get there uh, because I was um, very impressed this year by an article uh, written by one of my Icelandic colleagues, Hökur Thorgersson, uh, who uh, wrote a two-page article that nonetheless completely rewrites Tolkien scholarship about where Tolkien got his elves from. So it's just an article called J.R.R. Tolkien and the Ethnography of Elves. Um, and Hökur points out that although it, there's lots of research about J.R.R. Tolkien and where he gets his ideas from and how he drills them from the Middle Ages. And lots of people have written a lot about where he might have got his ideas for elves from. But Hoker points out that actually Tolkien must have read the introduction to Jon Altnason's Islandska Fjölsöger or Eiventyri, uh, a book of Icelandic folklore and fairy tales published in 1862. And in the introduction to this book, this Icelandic folklore scholar, Jörg Alpnason, talks about elves in Iceland. And Tolkien just took the whole lot and kind of built Middle Earth around it. So um, I'm just impressed that Hoker in two pages has rewritten the kind of history of elves in Tolkien's work. Um, but, uh, but this is going to be interesting for us in other ways too. So uh, Jörg Alpnason was drawing on... Uh, an early modern humanist writer, Jón Gruðmundsson Lærði, um, Jón Gruðmundsson the Learned, who wrote a uh, uh, treatise, a book called Teeth for the Drive, uh, there's a picture on the screen, um, which was talking about why elves are real and how they fit into Christian theology. So Jón Gruðmundsson was sitting there in Iceland and he's like, well, we all know that elves are here. Um, how do they fit with Christian thought? I'm a Renaissance humanist, I'm going to write a book about it. And so Tolkien is indirectly drawing on that in his ideas about elves. And Jan Bruthmanson gives us an interesting insight into how, in this case, early modern Christians were thinking, OK, elves are in the Bible. I know they're real. How does all this fit together? So um, in a lot of computer games and, and modern media, elves are a way to think about race, partly about class. Uh, in Iceland, we can see that they're doing a lot of other things too. And um, I've kind of researched quite a lot about modern Icelandic use and abuse of elves. So I don't know how much you guys have heard about elves in Iceland in the present. Uh, I had a quick look on the internet and there is Spanish language journalism about uh, Icelanders and how they all believe in elves. Um, so, you know, these rumours may have reached you guys just as much as they have people in Britain. There's this idea that Icelanders in the present all believe in elves and they yeah, and, and, and that elves uh, kind of sometimes stop machinery when people are trying to build roads and people redirect roads to kind of avoid elf habitat and stuff like that. So I've kind of looked into this stuff and I don't think actually anyone in Iceland really believes in elves apart from a few kind of you know, neo-pagan kind of uh, people who are very unusual or a few kind of spiritualist uh, uh, outliers. Basically, people in Iceland don't believe in elves. But I did recently write a book about modern Icelandic literature. It was about the 2008 financial crisis and how that relates to Iceland. And um, lots of Icelandic writers do talk about elves. And it's not because they believe in elves, but it's because... Uh, Elves have become kind of a symbol of the Icelandic nation and of what a kind of good Icelander should be like. And elves beca have become a way in which Icelanders talk about tradition and modernization and how they don't like modernization. So I don't know what the Mexican equivalent might be, right? But in Britain, we might talk about archaeological sites. 
and people are trying to build a road and will say, no, you can't build a road there because it will disrupt the archaeological site. And elves are kind of used in a similar way, right, to talk about heritage and the past and and the nation uh, and its relationship with kind of modernization and its tradition. OK, so that's going to take us from the present back towards the past, because um, I, and I suppose the point I'm making is that elves are still used today, right? We still have, we still talk about elves, they still influence our understanding of the world, even if we don't believe in them in a simple and straightforward way. So let's probe belief a little bit more. Um, are elves just a discourse, just a way of talking? Um, there's a phrase that I've picked up somewhere along the, the way, and I don't know quite where I got it from, but there's this phrase, people do and do not believe in elves, in God, in democracy or capitalism, any sorts of ideologies. Uh, we might expect to see people having this kind of complex relationship with elves in the past as well. Maybe people don't think they should believe, but just can't help it. Maybe they find that believing in elves is useful. So I'm going to take a step back into the past, but first I will check with Erevin whether you guys are looking okay. Thank you. Como van? Bien. Con toda confianza, si hay que regresar alguna diapositiva o interpretar, pero si van todos bien, everything looks great. Cool. Okay, you guys are a brilliant audience. Yeah, Thank they you. are. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, Let's think about what elves were for in medieval Europe rather than what they're for at the moment in Europe. Uh, and to start us on this journey, I'm going to take us to the late 14th century, to a very famous work of English literature from the 14th century, the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Um, the Canterbury Tales is a big collection of stories told by people who are on a pilgrimage to Canterbury in the southeast of England. And one of the stories is told by a miller. So it's called The Miller's Tale. And I won't summarise the whole of this story to you, but um, the key detail that we need is that in this story, uh, there is a student. He's a university student called Nicholas. And he um, has a landlord who lives in the house of a carpenter. So Nicholas is highly educated, very clever, goes to university. The landlord who he lives with is um, uneducated. He's just a carpenter. And this uh, carpenter has a very beautiful young wife who Nicholas, this student, wants to have sex with. So Nicholas thinks up a plan where he's like, OK, how can I get this carpenter out of the way so that I can have sex with his wife. Um, I know I'll pretend that I've had a vision of the future using my astrological learning, saying that there will be a flood, just like in the Bible. And I, I won't explain quite how that gets the carpenter sufficiently out of the way that Nicholas can then have sex with the carpenter's wife, but the plan does work. OK, so um, Nicholas pretends to have had this amazing vision of the future and he just lies in his bedroom staring at the ceiling, you know, as undergraduates sometimes do. And uh, his very caring landlord kind of knocks on the door, says, Nicholas, are you OK? And he goes in and sees Nicholas lying there. And I'll read out my modern English translation. Uh, this carpenter says, oh, no, Nicholas, what's going on? Look down, wake up and think of Christ's crucifixion. I cross you against elves and spirits. That is, I make the sign of the cross uh, against elves and spirits. And he said the night prayer straight away. Uh, here it is in Middle English. What, Nikolai, what, who, what, look at doon? A walk and think on Christus passion. A creature there from Elvis and from Wichtes. Therewith, the nicht spell seder he and on Richtes. Okay, so um, here we've got loads of elf stuff going on that I'm not going to kind of try to bring in all the evidence for, but I'll use this as an opportunity to kind of talk about what elves do in the world of Geoffrey Chaucer. So, partly, we've got Geoffrey Chaucer, the literate, very clever poet telling a story about an illiterate carpenter and laughing at this carpenter's um, superstition and credulity 
like the carpenter's willingness to believe any rubbish. The carpenter will believe so much that he believes that Nicholas is having this vision. Um, he believes that another flood is going to come and he believes in elves. So uh, Geoffrey Chaucer is positioning himself and his audience as people who don't believe. OK, they're too clever to kind of fall for this nonsense about elves. They're kind of proper, well-educated, well-behaved Christians who don't kind of have this kind of superstitious rubbish. But Chaucer is also portraying a world in which some people do think that elves might possess someone or cause them to be sick. And they might use prayers and the sign of the cross to try to fix that problem. So Chaucer is giving us kind of two images of what society is doing with elves. And also, at the time of Geoffrey Chaucer, if you tell stories about elves, uh, particularly in romances, um, but also in other kinds of literature, elves are often having sex with people. So um, elves were used in medieval England and elsewhere in medieval Europe to think about um, sexual predators, um, the threat of rape, um, the threat of seduction, uh, the threat of um, fornication, you know, your wife kind of going off and having sex with someone else. These supernatural beings were used as a way to talk about sex and sexuality and illicit sexual activity, both kind of desired and not desired, um, in quite sophisticated ways. So that's one of, well, several of the things that elves are for. Elves clearly cause illness, and you need to have prayers to fix elves. Uh, elves might get up to kind of seductive sexual activity. Elves might not really be real, and you might laugh at people who think they're real. So Geoffrey Chaucer in the late 14th century takes us into that kind of complex world of what's going on with beliefs in elves. At roughly the same time, though, you know, we can see the world of Geoffrey Chaucer's um, carpenter um, kind of playing out in real life. So um, we've got a variety of um, lead tablets that are found in Britain, Scandinavia, Germany, um, with... Um, kind of healing messages on them that you can read out or you could, you know, hold this tablet against someone to get rid of elves. Um, yeah, to get rid of elves or demons. So I've got a quotation. Unfortunately, the picture here is not a picture of the thing that I'm quoting from because I couldn't find an example. Uh, I couldn't find a picture on the internet. But, um, but the picture is of the kind of object that I'm talking about, these little lead tablets with text written in them. The picture is actually one in runic letters. Um, but the one I'm reading out uh, is from Denmark. It's from the late 12th century. Uh, and it says, Adjuro was, Elvos, well, Elvas, or sorry, Elvos, well, Elvas. So my classical, am I going to do classical Latin or medieval Latin? I should do medieval Latin. Adjuro vos, Elvos, well, Elvas, alt demones. Um, I command you, Elvos or Elvas or demons, and then the text kind of goes on as it commands them to kind of leave the sick person. So here we've got an interesting world where elves have been integrated into Latin. They've got kind of masculine elves, Elvos, feminine elves, Elvas, and, uh, and there's a sense that there's something to do with demons, but no one's quite sure what. But people are clearly taking this seriously. They're writing this down. Um, they're writing the same texts in manuscripts. One of these uh, lead uh, amulets has been found underneath an altar in Scandinavia in a church. So um, although Geoffrey Chaucer is kind of laughing at people who pray to fix problems with elves, this is definitely a real thing. And we can see it happening in uh, the medieval world. OK, I'm about to go back in time again. I'll just check with Erwin if things are looking OK, if you need me to. Yeah. Let me just check. ¿Cómo van? ¿Todo bien? ¿No va muy rápido? Perfecto. Regresamos contigo. We're back to you, Alaric. Groovy. OK. So we've thought about what elves have been for in medieval Europe. And whereas in the present, they're definitely about thinking about race, sometimes thinking about the nation, um, in the past, we don't see those factors so obviously, maybe not even at all. The idea of kind of tradition and modernity, though, is there in the past. You know, Chaucer is thinking about superstition and then kind of sensible 
kind of forward thinking, highly educated Christian belief. So for Chaucer, elves are a kind of marker of tradition versus modernity. Um, they're definitely a way to think about illness and they're a way to think about sexuality. Um, and maybe I'll say at this point that when I'm teaching students here at Leeds University and you kind of say to people, you know, why did people believe in elves? Uh, why might people pray to God to sort out these problems? Um, my students will very often say, well, they believed in elves because they didn't have an explanation for disease. Poor medieval people. We have science. We know what's going on. Medieval people didn't have an explanation. And I'm like, no. Elves are an explanation for disease, okay? We might not like that explanation. We may not think it's true or correct, but it is an explanation. And having an explanation for why you're sick and you can't participate in the economic life of your community um, or potentially for why you're pregnant when you're not supposed to be, um, elves are potentially a real and useful explanation. So these, you can see ways in which these beliefs might be useful to people. Okay, so we've talked a bit about like the 13th, 14th century, but for me, that's a bit late, okay? Um, it's too easy studying stuff in those periods because they write too much and it's, you know, there's too much evidence. So I'm always interested to go back further in time. And as I go back further in time, I'd like to think a bit more about this question of what were elves? And, um, you know, I've talked a bit about what elves do. I've talked a bit about how we think they look a bit like Legolas or whatever. Um, and uh, I want to think about what elves were by um, recalling a debate that was going on through the 20th century. So um, for much of the 20th century, scholars who studied medieval English elves uh, thought, OK, what did these kind of look like? Uh, what kind of beings were they? Mm, kind of demonic. They caused disease. Um, maybe they look like these little guys with wings in this picture. So this is an 11th century uh, English manuscript. It's actually a manuscript of the Psalms, you know, the book of the Bible, well, of the Hebrew Bible with all the songs of David, right? Um, and uh, lots of scholars literally looked at this picture and they were like, oh, yeah, these little guys with the wings and the pointy ears, those are elves. So through the 20th century, scholars kind of thought that elves must look like this. Um, and they were kind of encouraged in this because um, there is this idea that elves cause illness by shooting people. And even though in this picture, it's obviously Christ at the top who is shooting this person who's kind of suffering wounds that God is kind of inflicting on him. It's the kind of thing that happens in the Old Testament. Um, uh, yeah, people still looked at these little guys with the wings and they said, these must be elves. But uh, towards the end of the 20th century, uh, a woman called Karen Jolly and myself went off and we said, no, this is just a normal picture of demons from the 11th century. This is a routine depiction of, um, yeah, kind of Judeo-Christian Mediterranean demons. This is nothing to do with elves. This is a completely theologically normal illustration of the Psalms. Um, and the kind of research that I was doing for my PhD, for my doctorate, um, was looking at what evidence there is back into the kind of 10th, 9th, even 8th century for what English speakers and you know medieval Scandinavians thought elves were like. And although we don't have very clear evidence, um, there's nothing to suggest that People thought that elves were small or had pointy ears or had wings. It seems like elves were people. They were supernaturally powerful people, but they're people. They live next door to you, you know, maybe in a mound, maybe in the woods. You may not normally meet them, but uh, if you do, you wouldn't necessarily know that they weren't a person. Um, and I'll... I was able to pull together quite a lot of evidence for that, really dating back to our very earliest English texts around the kind of 7th or 8th century. Um, so I'm happy to go into that if people want to ask questions about it. But the idea that, you know, Legolas looks a bit like a normal person, I really do think that's what was people were thinking way back into the sort of 8th century. Elves were people, but they were kind of magically powerful people, and they kind of lived next door. 
a little bit like how elves work with race now. Okay, so now I might define myself as British or as white um, or as European or whatever it might be by contrasting myself with other human ethnic groups, by contrasting myself with Americans, because British people always like to hate Americans or the French, um, or whoever it might be. Um, and elves are fulfilling that kind of function. They're the humans who live next door who tell you who you are because you are not them. But the kind of evidence we have to work with for the early medieval period around the ninth century is very kind of fragmentary and limited. So this is the kind of text that we find, but it's the kind of text I find fascinating. I'll read this out in translation, then I'll read it out in Old English too. It's from a book of medical texts from the late 9th century. Many of these medical texts are translated from Latin. This particular one doesn't seem to be. And it says, well, this is just the beginning of, of a set of kind of recipes. Prescriptions against every railed rumor, which seems to mean like magic song, but we're not quite sure. And alfseden, which seems to mean elf magic, being a charm, powder, drinks, and a salve for fevers. And if the illness should be upon livestock, that's animals, farm animals, and if the illness should happen to a person, or a mara should ride and happen in all seven remedies. Uh, this word mara in Old English um, is the word that we have in modern English as nightmare. Um, etymologically, it, or historically, it means some kind of supernatural female being that attacks you in the night. Um, so... We've got all these medical texts. It's making, those are making it clear that elves are causing illness. Elves might be causing illness through some kind of magic. Um, and uh, yeah, we have to kind of build on this kind of fragmentary evidence to kind of get a bigger picture of what might be going on. Uh, to save time, actually, I won't read out the Old English. If you're desperate to hear Old English later, I can, uh, you can ask me to read it and I'll, I'll read it out. Um, but we can compare things like that Old English text with other texts that are being produced around Britain in the same period. And one of my favourite is the medieval Irish story, Shadaglia con Colline. Um, Shadaglia means uh, a sickness that makes you waste away um, consumption, a sickness that makes you kind of not eat and just kind of shrivel up and, and die. Um, and Shadaglia con Colline is a text about how a famous Irish hero, Cahullan, um, is afflicted with this wasting sickness, this consumption. Um, and the story talks about how, um, it's not the bit on the screen, but before the bit on the screen, he um, sees two swans flying across a lake and they have a golden chain connecting them between their necks. And this is not usual. And foolishly, Cahullan thinks he can capture them, so he shoots at them with a spear and... Um, yeah, basically, if you see magic looking swans flying across a lake, don't try to shoot them because not long after, he mysteriously sits down, putting his back against a standing stone um, and falls asleep. And while he's asleep, two women come up to him and they beat him with horse whips and laugh at him. And uh, after that, he is afflicted with the sickness as though dead. And he stays like that until he agrees to have sex with the queen of the ice Shiva, which is to say the kind of people of the mounds, the mysterious people who live next door to normal people um, living in mounds. So the kind of thing that's going on here with someone being afflicted sort of magically by these supernatural beings who live next door um, seems to be a similar kind of scenario to what might produce this Old English situation where You've got elf magic kind of causing you trouble. You've got illness and fever. Uh, you've got a mara, this kind of supernatural female being that kind of oppresses people in the night, which kind of sounds a bit sort of sexual. So I imagine that a story like this Irish one sits behind those kinds of old English medical texts. But the great thing about medical texts that's different from this Irish story is that they're serious texts, okay? This isn't just like a wacky tale and you get to the end and just go, oh, that was a fun story. These medical texts are, are actually intended to heal actual sickness. And that kind of tells us that people are taking elves 
really seriously and enables us to kind of study their everyday lives in ways that otherwise we wouldn't be able to. Okay, so I've been talking for nearly half an hour. I should uh, kind of wrap things up fairly soon, I guess. Uh, I'm just going to ask Ervin how things are looking at his end. Are you okay, Ervin? <laughs> okay. ¿Cómo van? Bien. Ya se está acercando al final de la plática, así que si te vienen preparando comentarios o preguntas, váyanlas alistando. All good. Back to you. Okay. And does it sound about right if I go for 10 minutes? I can go for longer, but I but if, you know. Depende de ustedes. Él dice que si puede alargarse un poco más, 10 minutos. O si quieren ir directo a preguntas, hacerlo menos. ¿Cómo, cómo se sienten? ¿Que les siga? Ya, yeah, I think they're they looking forward to uh, hearing more from you. So you can go over those 10 okay. minutes. Let, let's, let's see how we go. All right, thanks. Yeah, they're loving you. Um, so, yeah, um, to kind of give a, an overview of what I think is mostly going on in early medieval Europe, without going into all of the evidence that I kind of studied. Um, this is a kind of diagram of how I think the world looks in medieval Scandinavia, in this case. So, so all the words in this diagram are Old Norse medieval Scandinavian words. Um, but I think something like this is probably working in medieval England as well. So we've got a big circle there saying beings. OK, so fine. The world is full of beings. Um, And some of those beings are not supernatural. So they're, they're normal humans, okay? Not necessarily all humans, because I think we have to recognize that in medieval worldviews, some humans can have supernatural powers. Witches, uh, definitely humans, they can live next door, you can take them to court and prosecute them. Um, saints, you know, they can do miracles, but they're definitely flesh and blood humans. So. Some humans can be supernatural, but normal humans, the kind of humans I bump into it from day to day, we're not supernatural, we're just normal. So we've got the human in-group, the kind of people like us uh, on the screen there. But then we kind of move outwards to other beings who are humans or human-like and are supernatural. So this might involve non-Christian gods. So you might have heard of the medieval Scandinavian Aesir, Um, definitely our medieval Scandinavian Alvar, that's our elves. Um, also people in other ethnic groups, potentially. So in medieval Scandinavia, we hear quite a lot about Finnar. They give their name to Finland and Finns. Um, but uh, the Finnar would also include Sami people from, well, Sami people are now associated with northern Scandinavia. They were found much further south in, in the Middle Ages. So People from other ethnic groups might also kind of have magical powers and seem a bit weird and freaky. Um, so we've got these kind of human-like, you know, or human but supernatural people. And then we've got people who might be supernatural and human-like, but they're, they're now monstrous. Okay, so uh, they're dangerous and chaotic and they want to tear our world apart. So in Old Norse, we have outlaws who are kind of, you know, fundamentally socially damaging, uh, berserkir, um, berserkers, these people who kind of fly into kind of supernatural, freaky anger and keep challenging people to fights and stealing people's daughters. Um, Dregar, that's walking corpses, you know, when people are dead, but then they start kind of coming back and eating your sheep or banging on your roof at night. Uh, these are monstrous, okay? These are, you know, they're, they're still human uh, and, and they're supernatural, but, but now they're kind of the bad guys. And then finally, we've got monstrous, supernatural, non-human beings who might include beings called Jötnar, so giants, or Thussar, another word for giants, or dwarves, Dvergar, they don't have a very good reputation in medieval Scandinavia. Um, so the way I imagine it is that elves, because they're a lot like us, um, they're not imagined as trying to tear the world apart, okay? They're not trying to bring about the Ragnarok, the end of the world. Um, they're not like Satan and his minions trying to just bring society crashing down. Um, but they are dangerous. You know, if you kind of graze your cow in the wrong place, 
you might get sick or your cow might get sick. Um, if you go wandering in the wood at the wrong time of day, uh, you might get seduced by an elf. So, as I say, they're dangerous, they might cause illness, but they're not fundamentally chaotic forces. They're not trying to destroy the world. So, having pulled together a lot of evidence, that's the kind of overall picture that I came to. And I kind of still partly believe it, but quite a lot of subsequent work that people have done over the last 15 years or so has just emphasised that, you know, it is complicated. We do have texts where elves are positioned as being demons, or where the text will talk about elves and giants and dwarves all together as if they seem to be the same kinds of things. So I think I have to accept that although I quite like this diagram, and I think it's kind of a useful map for how people saw the world some of the time, it's a very leaky map, a kind of fuzzy, messy map where, you know, the categories are not neat and the categories can often blur or move. Okay, so uh, having kind of given that picture of how elves are like us, but they've got magical powers, they're dangerous, but not necessarily always trying to just destroy everything. Um, and that we can kind of trace that back right to the earliest medieval evidence. Um, and I want to think a little bit about how much um, elves changed in medieval culture, and then move on a bit more to speculate about how else we might try to study elves in the future. So um, on the screen, I've just got two recent uh, works, which uh, I've been quite excited by. Um, which one will I do first? I will do the boring looking one, uh, the black and white one by Felix Luma, uh, an article from 2021 based on Felix's uh, PhD research in Iceland. And it's called Of Magical Beings and Where to Find Them on the concept of Alvar in the translated Riddarasurgur. So Riddarasurgur are romances, um, uh, literally sagas about knights. Um, so chivalric stories. And lots of these get translated from mostly French, partly German, into uh, medieval Icelandic. And so we've got this big collection of, you know, 13th, 14th century Icelandic translations of continental romances. And it's been really cool to see Felix go off and study that material because um, he's able to show fairly convincingly that as Iceland kind of comes into contact with this medieval continental literature, they start to kind of think differently about elves. Um, in earlier Icelandic sources, people never talk about elf women. Whenever people talk about elves, they seem to be men. You know, maybe there are female elves out there, but just no one ever talks about it. A bit like how infamously no one ever really talks about female dwarves. Um, you know, Tolkien hardly has any female dwarves. You kind of think, how do dwarves reproduce? Medieval Icelanders are kind of the same. They're just like, we're just interested in men, okay? And then around the 13th century, they're like, oh, no, we should have elf women as well. And they've got lots of words already for supernatural females, but they kind of come up with a new word, alvquana, which just means elf woman. And they start to use that to translate French concepts of the fée, you know, um, supernatural fairy beings. Um, and so we can see kind of these beliefs shifting as ideas are traveling around medieval Europe. And in particular, we can see ideas about gender shifting. Um, and Felix uh, has kind of built on some of my work, which was nice for me to see. Um, he's built on some of that research to argue that um, in pre-Christian and kind of traditional Northwest European culture, um, people think it's quite cool if you are gender transgressive. So many of you will have heard of the medieval Norse god Loki. You might have heard that at one point he turns into a female horse and has children. Um, Odin, the kind of chief god in Old Norse kind of literature, um, seems to have spent some time himself being, well, he, there are definitely stories where he sort of turns into a woman or disguises himself as a woman, partly to do magic. And it kind of seems like medieval Scandinavians were like, well, that's a bit freaky, but also cool. And um, that kind of transgression was a way to kind of access power. Um, and later in the Middle Ages, I mean, basically, Judeo-Christian culture really gets upset if you mess with gender categories. They're like, no, 
this is not empowering. This is freaky and and uh, disturbing. I say that. I mean, saints also mess with gender categories in various ways. Monks mess with gender categories. So do nuns. But there's a sort of Judeo-Christian sense that you, you shouldn't go around dressing as women if you're a man. Uh, it's not cruel. It's not empowering. And so we start to see gender norms being aligned more closely with how supernatural beings behave in later literature. So we can see a lot of stability in medieval culture in Europe, but we can also see cultural change and religion and uh, access to different kinds of literature shifting how people talk about the world and think about the world. And they change their beliefs about supernatural beings to keep those beliefs useful and to kind of keep up with changing ideas. So speaking of change, the other thing on the screen here is a book from, did it come out last year? I think it's 2022. Uh, this is by an ex-PhD student of mine. In fact, Edwin, Edwin might know Rose. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, okay. Um, so Rose wrote her PhD about changelings. Changelings are babies that get taken away by supernatural beings. Well, no, babies. Babies are babies that get taken away by supernatural beings, but then the supernatural being puts another baby in its place that looks like the one it's stolen, and that is the changeling. Um, and, you know, the, the replacement baby does not grow well, uh, it's annoying, it doesn't eat properly, it keeps crying, um, and so changelings are bad news. And, you know, it means that someone, you know, an elf or someone else has got your nice baby. And uh, in the early modern period, elves kind of uh, taking babies and leaving changelings all over the place, widely in medieval Europe. Um, and, you know, through to the 19th century, even the 21st century, stories about changelings are being kind of collected by folklorists. Um, and so it's been tempting to think, yeah, that's just been the case forever. But when Rose was doing her research, you know, she really struggled to find any stories about elves swapping babies before the late 14th century. But quite a lot with demons taking babies and leaving replacements, certainly back into like the 12th century, something like that. Um, and I don't know if it'll be interesting to see what happens as people do more research and follow this up. But Rose makes the argument anyway that really changelings are a thing. Uh, in medieval Europe until the idea develops within Christian thought and in relation to a few particular saints and uh, one or two of whom get taken by demons and like changelings are left in their place and the saint manages to get back to his, his own family. Um, so Rose kind of sees that developing in a very much a Christian and partly Mediterranean tradition and then kind of getting integrated with traditional ideas about elves in Northwest Europe later. So we do have the sense that culture changes during the Middle Ages and ideas that we might think are actually, you know, that we might think are quite ancient might actually be fairly recent. As I say, I'll be interested to see whether future research kind of fits with that picture. OK, so that's some stuff about kind of current research and also about how ideas about elves were changing over time. My plan now is to bring us into land by thinking about where we're going next for studying elves. Edwin, does that look all right? Do you want to check with the audience? Do you just want me to kind of keep going? Yeah, sure. Uh, ahorita ya vamos a la última para aterrizar el, el tema y posteriormente podemos pasar a las preguntas. ¿Perdón? Ah, cambiando bebés. O sea, swapping, es como... ¿sí? ¿Esa es su bolsa? Ah, si yo hago swap, le agarro su bolsa y le pongo otra para que no se dé cuenta. Entonces la idea era que eh, existía esta noción de que los bebés pueden ser cambiados por seres supernaturales, sobrenaturales, y por eso el bebé cambiado no era un bebé completamente humano, era sobrenatural y daba mucha lata. O sea, esas historias que los demonios cambiaban. ¿Eh? Ah, eso es parte de, de la historia. Sí, no lo mencionó específicamente, pero normalmente era, pues, obviamente convertirlo a ser supernatural y molestar al humano que trataba de seguir valores cristianos. Muy bien. Ok, I mean, there's an illustration of that happening on the uh, cover yeah. of this book. 
I don't I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse pointer. So uh, yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, there. Oh. Ah, here. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm okay. Out well, I don't know what Erwin is saying either. Aquí se puede ver el como la criatura sobrenatural metiéndose a la cuna y cambiando al bebé. No worries, I'm, I was pointing out straight into the <laughs> image. Oh, great. Yeah, okay. Cool. So, yeah, bottom right on the image. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but here's a demon yes. stealing a baby. And here's, you know, well, sorry, this is a demon probably putting the new baby in place. And in the middle of the picture, you can see the, a demon stealing the nice baby. Okay, are we all right to go on? Yes. For the okay. Final slide. I'll, probably be about five minutes. So where do I think we should go next in studying elves? I don't know if any of you guys are interested in studying elves, so you may, you know, may not want to hear about this, but um, it's also kind of partly thinking about where should we be going in our studies of medieval Europe as well. So certainly when I did my PhD about elves, I was really focused on Old English, to some extent German and Scandinavian material, and that was a way to kind of limit that research to a, a, a doable amount but um, I and quite a lot of people coming after me have been very stuck in a Germanic language bubble so I'm partly excited that uh, Felix Luma and Rose have been looking at romance language literature literature in medieval French in medieval Italian um, also in Latin and starting to kind of develop more of a dialogue between medieval Germanic language sources and Romance language sources. And there's clearly more work to be done there, and that would be very interesting. And yeah, kind of give us some new perspectives. Don't know how likely it is that anyone here is ever going to learn Finnish or Estonian, but I'm really into the fact at the moment that there is just amazing collections of 19th century folklore in Finnic languages which some of which is really kind of similar in very striking ways to uh, my medieval stuff about elves and someone should do more on that uh, maybe eventually it might be me but i'd be grateful if someone else did it um but the point that i really want to linger on is that if we're going to do more with elves we should be developing more dialogues with islamicate texts that is texts from the Islamic or the uh, Muslim influenced world. Um, so what I want to do is just to give a tiny example of some of the possibilities that are out there for comparative study of medieval Germanic and um, elves and jinn from the uh, medieval Islamicate world. So probably you've heard of jinn, but they're these supernatural beings who again, you don't normally see, but they live next door to everyday people. Um, you might have sex with them. Quite a lot of people do in the Middle Ages. They might cause illness. They're really very similar to our friends, the elves. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, Islam gets going in the Arabian Peninsula in the 7th century. And 7th century Arabia is kind of more similar to Northwest Europe at the same time than you might at first think. So admittedly, Northwest Europe does not have hot, sandy deserts, and it does not have camels. Um, but both of these regions are on the edge of the Roman Empire, or what had been the Roman Empire, or the Byzantine Empire. Um, they're very much in contact with the Christian, um, partly Jewish, um, Roman world, but they're, they're outside it. And so they're in a situation where they kind of want to get all that cool Roman stuff, both literal money, but also technology like literacy and um, ways of kind of expressing power like kingship. They want to kind of access these, or emperorship, I should say. They want to access those ideas from the outside. Um, and they're kind of borrowing these ideas in interesting ways. So... Um, as people are converting to Christianity in 7th century Britain, they're actually going through a process, I think, very similar to what uh, Muhammad is doing in the Arabian Peninsula, as he's kind of saying, well, Judaism is kind of cool, Christianity is kind of cool, uh, I like this monotheism idea, but I'm going to make it my own. Um, well, that's not what he's saying, he just thinks he's hearing messages from God, so fair enough. But in a kind of historicist political perspective, He's thinking, okay, how do I adapt 
Judeo-Christian traditions to suit me. And that's what's going on in uh, Northwest Europe at the same time as well. It's just that people in Northwest Europe call themselves Christians and people in Arabia call themselves Muslims. But a huge difference between Islam and Christianity is that jinn are in the Quran. Okay, so jinn are well integrated into the cosmology of the Quran, I should say. Um, so if you're a, a Muslim who believes the literal text of the Quran, you have to believe in jinn. So whereas in medieval Europe, people are a bit like, oh, elves, well, I know they're there, but they're not in the Bible. I don't really know where they fit. I'm not quite comfortable with this. In the Islamic world, like medieval writers actually have to write about the jinn because it's part of their theology. Um, and indeed, the book that's on the screen, uh, Islam, Arabs and the Intelligent World of the Jinn by Amira Ez Zain, um, it's from 2009. It's a cool book. It's a scholarly book, but it is written from the perspective that jinn are real. Um, you know, evidently, Amira Ez Zain is a kind of devout Muslim and she's like, OK, I'm going to write about jinn as real beings, just as Christian theologians write about the Christian God as a real person. But it's also got lots of really interesting stuff about kind of historical texts. Um, in medieval Andalusia, I thought I'd mention this because I'm in a kind of Hispanic speaking context. And maybe you guys think about Al-Andalus a little bit. Um, people like Abu Amir uh, ibn Shahid uh, writes uh, a Risalat al-Tawabiyya wa, uh, wa Zawabiyya. Uh, a treatise on the familiar spirits and the demons. So people in medieval Islam are writing kind of quite big books about jinn, about people who are a lot like elves. You know, theologians and jurists even have to write texts about, is it okay to marry a jinn? How should you feel if your daughter goes off and has sex with a jinn who, you know, has paternity in this situation? So they have to deal with all this. And there's just loads of exciting possibilities for comparing that material with what's going on in Northwest Europe. Uh, I'll give a teeny weeny example of the kinds of things that people might do, and then I'll finish. So, um, is, oh, is that okay, Edwin? I can just finish. Let's, let's just finish. I won't give my teeny weeny example. I'll move through these slides and get to the end. Here, oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Slow slides. Uh, okay. I think. Okay. So elves in the present are for thinking about race and class um, and in the middle ages I think they were used to think about race or ethnicity as well maybe not nations they were for thinking about tradition and modernization they were a way to think about illness they were definitely a way to think about sexuality people believed in elves in different ways to differing amounts during the medieval period in uh, Europe and there are loads of opportunities for us to think more about how that worked particularly by moving beyond a kind of well-established body of research about Germanic language material and moving out to comparison with a much wider range of stuff. The final picture on the slide is a new book that I've only glanced at. It just came out, was it last year or this year? Twilight of the Godlings. If you're the kind of person who likes reading books in English, um, this is quite easy to read, uh, but also scholarly. Uh, it's not, you know, too heavy, but it's it's also not mad, uh, unlike a lot of books about elves. So if you wanted to read more, that would be a place to go. Thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias. And uh, yeah, I will stop there. Lamentablemente tenemos el tiempo cortito, pero quizá unos un par de minutos si hay eh, preguntas, aprovechando que Ari está conectado con nosotros. Déjame ver, move the laptop so you can see. Yo tengo el... uh, hi.
Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yes. So. Hi, good morning. Well, whatever it is, <laughs> I believe you're in, in the UK, so good evening. Uh, when you, thank you for, for your talk, it's very interesting. This latter part in which you mentioned the dialogue between Germanic and others. Well, okay, hang on. Yeah. I, I can't hear uh, oh. the person. Don't you might just have to stand near the computer. Yeah, is that okay? Okay, is it okay? Thanks. That's close. Yeah, that's great. Good. So uh, I was about to ask, first, I want to thank for this talk. And I want to ask, when you mentioned this latter part of the dialogue with other uh, types of languages, not necessarily the Germanic, it, it makes me wonder, because this is a question that I've had for a long time. Uh, when you read texts, for example, like Beowulf, etc., uh, there's a lot of, of mixture, or, or I like to see it as a mixture of cultures and, and beliefs, in which there is this Viking ideology, but you have a lot of input, at least in Gamir's translation, you have a lot of input of Christians, in which there is this, um, this one God, instead of believing in Odin and all of these, and I see that there's a correlation, a strong correlation with, with trade and with commerce, and you just mentioned this area of the Roman Empire. So c could it be that with trade, all of these traditions got from one place to another and they started blending? And that the idea of, for example, in your case, elves, is the same because I, I just saw the, uh, the, the the picture of the 37th Psalm. I read it in Spanish, and, and there is something like that could be interpreted as as something else. In this case, elves in that picture, but but it's something that that can be understood differently in other parts. I don't know. Here in Mexico, we have a lot of, of mythology, and that could also be kind of linked to the same idea that there are these specific, supernatural, non-monstrous beings. I don't know, I, I, I find it quite complex to, to explain, but <laughs> I see that no, no, there's that, a lot of correlation there. That, that's, a, that's a cool question, and it's, I mean, it's really fundamental to any historical study, because, yeah, like, partly, we want to find what's similar in human behavior in a particular place or a particular time or just in all human behavior. And so finding the things that are the same um, is itself very interesting. But then we want to find the things that are different because you know we want to look at change over time and we want to look at what's distinctive in different places and different moments. So you know, fundamentally, we need to continually go through this process of going, okay, what are the similarities? And then what's the same everywhere? Um, and I think it's, it's very easy if you just look at the Germanic language material to be like, okay, these are distinctively Germanic beliefs. And then you look at the stuff from Arabia at the same time, and you're like, oh, no, everyone kind of thinks this. Um, so, so then, you, you know, you have a very different picture of the material. Um, what I found when I was doing my PhD about elves was that people had taken a lot of ideas that were really from 19th century folklore and just put them back into the past without really checking whether there was evidence for that. And sometimes I found that 19th century ideas, like about changelings, didn't really kind of you know, appear in, in text from the past. So um, that enabled me to start to tell stories of change over time and um, cultural distinctiveness. Um, but that was just for, you know, a particular place, uh, you know, over a particular period. And just doing all of these different studies will gradually enable us to build up a much more sophisticated picture about, you know, what do all people think? What do all Abrahamic people think? What do all Christians think? What do, you know... 16th century Mexicans think and so forth that might be a bit of a vague answer but that's that's my response to your question it's a you know a really profound methodological question and I'm grateful for it lamentablemente si sí estamos ya excedidos del tiempo así que tenemos que detenerlo pero por supuesto eh, esperamos podamos seguir en comunicación con Eric I'm just telling them that uh, we're are uh, completely out of time, but uh, if there's anyone else who wants to ask any questions, 
I'm uh, assuming you have no issue with them contacting you. No, no, they're very welcome. Actually, very nice, as I said. Es muy amable desde el principio.